Hi everybody. In this problem, we're going to show that if we have an n cycle, that applying it n consecutive times is going to give you the same thing as if you had done nothing. You get the identity permutation. So let me start with an example. So say our sigma was equal to a four cycle. One, three, four, two. So the claim is that if I apply sigma four times in a row to any number, one, three, four, two, that I'm going to get back whatever number I started with. So we'll do a quick example. So I'm going to do this four times because this was a length four cycle. Uh, I'm going to apply it, say, to the number two. So this is the same thing as applying sigma cubed after applying sigma to two. You say, okay, well, what happens when I apply sigma to two? Two goes to one, so this is the same thing as applying sigma cubed to one. All right, but now that'll be the same thing as applying sigma squared to sigma of one. Okay, where does sigma send one? It sends one to three, so this is be the same as sigma squared of three. Okay, but that's the same as sigma of sigma of three, and sigma sends three to four, so this is sigma of four, and now I apply sigma to four and I get two, and that's actually, you'll see the number that I started with. So in total, sigma to the fourth applied to two gave me two, and you can check that if you applied sigma to fourth to any of the other numbers, that sigma to the fourth of anything would equal that same anything, and so that sigma to the fourth is equal to the identity map. All right, well, that's not a proof of the general case. Uh, that's just a specific example. So let's see what happens when we try to apply it in general. So we're going to want a little bit of notation, and you're going to see why in a second. So let's say my general permutation has, well, it's going to have n numbers, and I'm going to label them, and I'm going to label them in a slightly funny way. Um, my inclination would be to label them, say, a sub 1 through a sub n. But I'm going to use uh, indexes that start at 0 because I want to use modular arithmetic. I want to work modulo n, and it's a little more natural to use the numbers 0 through n minus 1 if I work modulo n. So uh, let's see what happens. If I apply sigma to some number that's actually moved by this cycle, then all it does is move it down one, right? For instance, a sub zero goes to a sub one, a sub one goes to a sub two. So sigma should send a sub i to a sub i plus one. Um, I can't quite write this though. There's a, there's a little hiccup. Namely, if I applied sigma to a n minus one, that actually goes back to a sub zero. And then this i plus one doesn't make sense anymore. So there's really two cases. If i was anything between 0 and n minus 1, but not including n minus 1, then you get a i plus 1. But in that special case where i is equal to n minus 1, then a sub i gets mapped to a 0. All right, well, I don't really like these piecewise defined functions so much, uh, so I'd like to combine it into 1. And, and this is where the modular arithmetic comes in. I know that if I apply sigma to uh, a sub n minus 1. If I added 1, that would give me a sub n, which doesn't exist in this cycle. Um, but n modulo n is the same thing as 0. And so you may remember this, that n is congruent to 0 modulo n. So I want to just use a little bit of notation here. Um, if I have um, some numbers, let's say, we'll, we'll actually do a little example to get this notation, say n was equal to 5, um, and I pick a couple of numbers. Uh, oops. So we'll say l is equal to 4, and k is equal to 3. I know that l plus k is equal to 7. But if I reduce modulo 5, I can get a 2. Okay, so I'm taking what's called um, <coughs> the least residue. So when I do that, I'm going to use just a slightly different notation. I'll put a plus, but then I'll put a little kind of half a box down here, which tells me I'm going to reduce this to 2. 
Okay, so I'm reducing modulo 5. Right? Remembering 7 is congruent to 2 modulo 5. Okay, so with this kind of plus box notation, I can rewrite what sigma does. It takes a sub i, it's going to add 1 to the index, and then reduce modulo n, which only in the case where i is n minus 1 does it actually mean anything. But I can write it now as a i box plus 1. All right, or at least it's a half box. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier. And now, if I apply, say, sigma squared to a sub i, that's the same thing as applying sigma to sigma of a sub i, which is sigma of a i box plus 1. And now I apply sigma again, it's just going to increase the index by 1 again, so i box plus 2. All right, and you might notice the pattern here. Every time I'm applying a sigma, so sigma to the 1, I get i box plus 1. If I apply sigma squared, I get i a sub i box plus 2. And in general, then, you could prove this really formally with induction if you wanted. Sigma to the n applied to a i will be a i box plus n. But here's the beauty. When I do box plus n, and now what does that mean? I'm going to reduce modulo n. That n goes away. Right? Modulo n, right? we said up here, n is congruent to 0. So this is actually just a sub i again. So in fact, applying sigma to the n to a sub i gives us a sub i. And so sigma to the n must be the identity, right? Because this was for all i. We didn't put a restriction on it. All right, and that was our goal. Our goal was to show that if you had an n cycle, then when you applied that n cycle n times in a row, you got the identity.